board member and director. And her keynote address is on ESG and the global drivers that are reshaping Australian agriculture. Please put your hands together for Catherine Marriott. The greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself, it's to act with yesterday's logic. Now this is a quote by a guy called Peter Drucker, who was an Austrian, Austrian American rather, management consultant, and he specialises in modern management theory. And I think that that's a really interesting way to open because what we're talking about fundamentally with natural capital and ESG is actually a change management piece. So we can't keep thinking about our farming businesses the way that we have done so in the past. And I've totally forgotten my phone, so can somebody keep me on track? Because my watch is also flat. <laughs> Winning at life. Um, so how many of you have heard of the team ESG before? P raise your hand. Okay, great. How many of you could confidently define it? Me either. <laughs> no, just joking. Hopefully we'll be able to, in the next half an hour or so, hopefully I'll be able to lift your knowledge a little bit and also, importantly, give you a bit of a global perspective of some of the drivers that are leading into the change that we're needed. Before I go any further at all, I would also like to pay my respects to the Elders past and present and emerging of the Wiradjuri Nation, um, which we're lucky enough to be having as our conference venue today. So my name is Catherine Marriott and I'd really love to thank Kate Jenkins particularly and also Local Land Services for leading an initiative like this. I think it's really important that we start the conversation. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Nuffield Australia for affording me the opportunity to um, com complete a Nuffield scholarship and AgriFutures who are the sponsor. Just a little shout out, Nuffield uh, applications are currently open. So if any of you have an idea that you think might move the needle in Australian agribusiness, please come and have a yarn and I can talk you through the process and encourage you to apply. Before I go too much further, I want to share with you, I'm not an ESG expert. I am a Nuffield scholar who's halfway through my journey. So I'm not going to provide you with a clear list of instructions of what you need to do to meet ESG requirements in the future, because to be frank, the world is still trying to figure it out. What is really important is I can share trends and what's actually happening to give you an idea to start thinking about what is important in your business and how you might start to collect data that's going to ensure that you maintain market access. The countries that I've travelled to so far on my Nuffield is Africa, Europe, the UK, Brazil, the US, Japan and South Korea. And I chose most of those countries because largely they are big trading nations. I've learned that the ESG landscape is complex, it's agendered, it's competing, it's opportunistic, but it is also riddled with hope, opportunity and risk, which most change management pieces are. There are so many competing aspects of ESG. There's consumer demands versus practical reality on farm. There's food security versus environmental preservation, environmental versus social outcomes, models level data versus individualistic investable data. So how should we prioritise and proceed with these things? So what is ESG? ESG is a term that was coined at a, in, in a 2004 UN report called Who Cares Wins? And really the crux of where that came from is a whole heap of rich people, I'm being crass here, but a whole heap of rich people that were wanting to invest in companies that they could feel good about not doing environmental damage or investing in slave labour. So I'm not sure how that is going, but there seems to be an awful lot of fuss about it at the moment. One of the guys that I met in South Korea, Yong Sik Ok, was, um, he was a professor at Korea University and I think he said it the best. He said, Catherine, ESG has two faces or ESG investment has two faces. So it has the public face where people want to be seen to be investing in the right things but the complexity lies with the fact that people and investors particularly also like making money and those two things can coexist but it's complicated. 
So the E stands for environment, and that includes things like carbon, natural capital, which is a big topic um, today, and it is a big focus on ESG, um, plastic usage, chemical and fertilisation usage, um, air quality, soil health, biodiversity, that sort of thing. The S stands for social, and that is worrying about things like um, wages, diversity and inclusion, indigenous inclusion, um, uh, diversity, uh, sorry, health and safety, workplace health and safety of people. And the G stands for governance. So that's looking at the overarching business management. So we're looking at risk, we're looking at transparency and data capture, we're looking at decision making, strategy, financial management, structures and legal requirements. To further expand on this, let's start with the E. So agriculture has a massive environmental footprint. According to the OECD, ag accounts for 50% of land usage, 73% of global deforestation, 70% of water utilisation and 34% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got a bit of work to do. Governments, investors, consumers and the public across the globe, particularly in wealthy nations, are responding to this by increasing their demand for sustainability credentials of our global food systems. So some governments, including Australia, are considering mandatory adoption of reporting standards. Now, this is particularly pertaining to climate risk and natural capital. And a little wee heads up, it isn't mandatory to report against those metrics now, but it's coming. And there's things like the Global Reporting Index, the Task Force for Nature-Based, Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, um, there's the International Financial Reporting Scheme, and I'm just sharing those with you. Don't get tied up in the detail, but they're there and they're currently voluntary, so it would be worthwhile having a bit of a look at those or speaking to the LLS staff and finding out what's available so that you're aware of and you can start thinking about and being proactive around what sort of data you may need to capture for your business. Farmers have a direct impact on E, so they can manage soils, crops, animals, water quality, biodiversity, etc. Where farmers have less of a direct impact is on the S, so that's things like um, community nutrition, hunger, discrimination and war, which is captured in the S pillar. Quite often we hear people, I, I hear people say, but Maz, what about, oh sorry, my nickname is Maz, um, what about, <laughs> fun fact, um, or Missy or Missile or any other million names that people call me. Um, so they, um, we get asked, why aren't we focused on the S? And the reality of it is we're in a pretty wealthy country and so the S is kind of taken care of. The S pertains to things like social and society outcomes. So in Australia, we have minimum wages, we have holidays and sick leave, we have workplace health and safety legislation. So all of that stuff is taken care of innately. Juxtapose that, however, with countries like Africa, South Korea, Japan, Indonesia, and their governments have a huge focus on S. They are trying to make sure that they've got access to clean, clean water. They're having access to enough nutrition, access to medicine. Um, and to them, those aspects are more important than caring for the environment. It's not that they don't care for the environment. It's just that they don't have the luxury of prioritising that like we do. Now for the G, again, governance is largely taken care of in Australia or wealthy nations. Companies' ability to manage risk, identify corruption and fraud, um, have excess, like have um, legal business um, structures and that sort of thing, is all largely taken care of. The G will become more prominent as these reporting standards are mandated globally. There are three drivers that are driving ESG globally. The first one is politics. And politics is really focused on the general public. So elected officials are going to go with where the public are asking them to go. We all know that old story about social licence and the fact that you need the community to come on board with you. And the, the role of activism plays a big part of that. So politics is driven by what the, what the general public want. Um, I'm not going to go too much further into it, but acknowledging that politics plays a really big role in the ESG conversation globally and is driving change, but not as much as I first thought. The second one is the commercial sector, and this is largely driven by shareholders, consumers and the public. Note, this is largely in wealthy nations, where they and, it, and to ignore this can get us in a little bit of a pickle. Um, investors don't understand practical realities of what's possible on farm 
Um, so they don't really understand what's practically involved with going carbon neutral, for example. As far as I can understand, it's the commercial sector that is really driving the need for ESG change. And the third driver of why you might want to engage in the ESG space is for you guys as business people. It sits in the opportunity boat. So can we flip the need for ESG data on its head and say, well, how can this actually help me and run my business and focus on aspects of my business that perhaps I hadn't really thought of before? It forces you to think about aspects of your business which may have been a leaking little hole that, you know, when you're focused on productivity and profitability, you may not necessarily think of, but it's important for the long-term viability of your business. So why did I get interested in ESG? I first came across the phase, I think, at an Australian Farm Institute conference about three years ago, and I thought, hmm, this is a post-farm gate thing that might start actually impacting people's businesses. Now, why, why post-farm gate? Because I was working in the live export industry when a post-farm gate decision shut that industry down. And I realised that farmers, or in that case pastoralists, were busy running really effective businesses. So they were looking after their cattle, looking after the environment, their workers, and a post-farm gate decision fundamentally impacted their, their, their trade. It became really rigid, bureaucratic and expensive to operate in that business. When I look at what's happening globally, I can see that there's similar things bubbling away in the ESG landscape that will fundamentally impact farmers without their input. There's lots of movement globally around ESG principles and it really um, relates to having non-tariff trade barriers put in place. So non-tariff trade barriers really refers to an increase in red tape that unjustifiably restricts trade. There are four main things that I wanted to achieve as part of my study. The first one is to make sure that farmers are aware of the changes that are going on globally so they can proactively make decisions that are right for their businesses. The second one is to understand what different countries are wanting so that as Australian farmers we can choose alternate markets if we need to and if importing countries from a government perspective are going to get too rigid and hard to deal with. And the third one is to inform RDCs and research and development corporations where they should be or could be um, investing their new R&D funding to make sure they're de-risking agriculture for you guys based on what the world market, a contemporary view of what the world markets are looking for. The fourth agenda I have is not so much related to farmers directly, but I've learned, I, we had a speech in Brazil actually by a guy called Wayne Dredge, and he's an Aussie fisherman, and he opened my eyes massively to how global policy is made. And, you know, people sit in and around rooms in Rome at the UN and pontificate about what farmers need to be doing with absolutely no regard for the practical realities of the implementation of what that actually means on farm. And I don't have time to go into some of his stories, but it's horrifying the lack of knowledge at those global policy decision-making tables. So let's talk about markets. Now, why do we need to think about markets? Because we need to sell our produce. And in ag, typically, we don't think about our customer that much. We're quite removed from how the end product is eaten. So we put a primary product off the, off the gate. And we don't really think about how it ends up in wheat bix. Knowing what our customers want and thinking what about, about the global priorities gives us time and scope to plan for what's coming down the line. And for Australian farmers, this is particularly important because we export 72% of the produce that we produce. So we export 78% um, of the, the beef, veal and mutton, for example. We export 65% of canola, 67% of wheat. So you can see that we, act, we do need to lift our eyes and have a look at what's happening globally so that we can make sure we're acting in a way that is conducive to, to maintain that market access. Now let's have a think about our major trading nations. So governments that may be, what governments might be expecting from an ESG perspective. So remember I said politics was one of the major drivers. I think to be honest, Japan and South Korea really surprised the pants off me, but I'll run through the countries in a, in a little while. One of the biggest shifts that my travel gave me was our countries and our trading nations worried about, um, you know, animal welfare and natural capital and ESG, those sorts of things, or are they focused on food security, poverty reduction, sanitation, those sorts of things? And it's interesting when you actually start to have a think about that from a systems perspective. However, this is a big however, by the way, 
Where we think pressure is coming from is government, but actually where the pressure is coming from is the commercial entities that are driven by shareholders and customers. So PepsiCo's, Cargill's, Nestle's of the world. They are owned and governed essentially by shareholders and they are getting more and more, the consumers are getting more discerning and they're getting more vocal about what's needed. We also need to consider our domestic market. So after travelling for 10 weeks around the world, I think Australia is really, really well placed, but we can't rest on our laurels. So we've got things like MLA's Carbon Neutral 2030. Now that was the first agenda like that in the world. And Australia has managed to move the needle by about 50%, I think it's 57%, drop in methane emissions in beef since they set that target. Now, the red meat industry and the manufacturing industry in Australia um, are the only ones that have significantly reduced their greenhouse gas emissions. So that's something that we can be really, really proud of. We also have sustainability frameworks. There's lots of beef sustainability, sheep, grain sustainability frameworks, and they culminate in the Australian sustainability framework. And I think Katie McRobert's going to share with you a little bit more about that. But travelling around the world, other countries are jealous of that because what that is, is it sort of it sets our light on the hill, if you like, uh, and it's been done with government, farmers and the commercial sector. So it's a really collaborative approach, which I think we can all be really proud of. However, we say that we can't in, um, rest on our laurels. And it's really important that you guys continue to engage with your RDCs to keep them investing in research that's going to impact you guys as businesses. They love hearing from you and they love the engagement. Identify where your biggest industry challenges are. So from a cropping perspective, it's your greenhouse gas emissions associated with fertiliser. And from the meat sector, it's your methane emissions. We don't need to, and this is a bit of a controversial thing, but I don't think we need to go blindly down the EU path of reducing our fertilisers and reducing our chemicals and reducing our livestock because I think in Australia, we've got capacity to be some of the most innovative people in the world. And we can actually come up with these solutions before it's a problem. Do we need to always keep an eye on efficiency and environmental markets? Yes. But can we use science to actually work um, for farmers so that they can maintain their production while they're reducing their greenhouse gas emissions? And I firmly believe that we can. We don't... We've got some of the most in, um, innovative and forward-thinking agripreneurs in the world, but we don't tell anyone. And I love... I, I went to a Vogue Ag earlier this year and I listened to a lady called Olympia Yager, and she's an amazing woman if anyone's ever come across her. But she said, you know, we need to be more proud and loud of what innovation and success we've got in ag in Australia. She said, instead of walking into a room and doing the Australian thing of like, oh, yeah, no, it's no big deal, we're not really that much of a big deal, walk in and go, hi, I'm here, you're welcome. And I just love the fact that she's like, we need to be much more proud of what we're doing because Australia, having travelled the world, is in a seriously leading position. Key to all of this, of course, is the commercialisation of the research. And it takes about seven years for us to get research to commercialisation, and that's if it works really well. So take the opportunity to meet with your RDCs, meet with your, um, the industry departments, to have a yarn to them about what's really important for your business. Lisa is here today. I think she's still on SAMRAC. South Australian Meat Research Council. So go up and have yarns with people like that because ultimately it's about um, long proof, long proofing, future proofing your businesses. <clears throat> if the RDCs don't get ahead of it and create innovation to help us reduce our emissions, the government is going to step in and do it for us because the government federally has signed up to things like the Kyoto Protocol, the Methane Pledge, the Paris Agreement, those sorts of things. So I said that I'd talk first about the drivers politically, and I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to leave Africa out, but if anyone wants to talk to me about Africa, I'm really happy to yarn. It was fascinating going to a developing country and seeing their priorities on ESG, and then it sort of got me reflecting... Ten minutes, thanks, Tal. Um, it got me reflecting on, you know... We spent, we 200 years ago, 150 years ago, cleared all our country, and now we're telling developing countries you can't do that. But we, you know, do, do we have a right to do that? With the, because now we've got knowledge that we didn't have when we did it. So it's a really complex um, thing to be thinking about. The European Union is also really interesting. The European Union is a leader. So they are a really good indicator. Now, the rest of the world sort of follows through about 20 years later where the EU has started. Um, they have a highly subsidised agriculture system because they're not profitable, but their government or the European Union recognises that they need farming. 
Um, they have things like the CAP, so the Common Agriculture Policy. For the first time, that is now tied to sustainability outcomes for their farmers. They've also bought in, and that's all driven from a strategy that they've got called the Green Deal, which means that they want to be the first carbon neutral continent by 2050. Now, there's things, other things that are being driven in the EU, like the deforestation legislation, uh, which means that anyone who's cleared trees after 2020 no longer has access to the EU. Now, that's interesting from a Brazilian perspective because Brazil provides the EU with 44% of their soy and their corn. So if you think about that, where is the EU going to get their soy from? And therein lies the complexity with the ESG conversation because people are wanting to do better, but the practical reality of how you're actually going to feed yourself is a very interesting piece. Um, the EU have got other initiatives like reducing their pesticides and their antimicrobials, so we call them antibiotics, in livestock production. Now, have a think about what that's going to do to profitability and productivity. They also have a goal of having 20% of their land mass organic. Now, the question remains, are they going to enforce that on countries that they are importing from? Uh, they've just, yet last week, passed another legislation, which was called the Corporate Sustainability to sustainability due diligence directive, and that's looking at environment and human rights. But all of those pieces of legislation are grossly watered down from where they started. And what I found interesting is that the EU Parliament is being hammered by the not-for-profit sector because they're not actually doing enough. So what I learned in the EU is that they've got all these altruistic goals, but the detail in how they're actually going to implement them is lacking or drastically watered down. So, is this a sign of things to come? Now, remember I said that politics is fickle. Um, speaking of elections and politics, the world, um, half of the world's population is going to go to the polls this year. So, nine out of ten major economies globally are going to the elections. And they're saying that there's going to be a large right-wing swing. So, what impact is that going to have on ESG directives globally? Moving on to Brazil. Brazil was the most extraordinary country. I have never been to a country where I think they've got the balance of environment and production correct. Brazil is not a subsidised country at all. They spend a lot of money on innovation, research, that sort of thing. Now, I was really surprised to learn that in the Amazon, if you own a farm in the Amazon, you are only allowed to clear 20% of it. You've got to protect 80% of it. Now, I think history, we can leave at the door. They've got new political system there in place and they have to protect 80%. So if you've bought a farm in the Amazon, you're only allowed to use 20% of it. In the Cerrado region, you're only allowed to use 65% of it. And in the rest of Brazil, you're only allowed to clear 80% of it. And you've got to put back forest if, it, if, you have cleared, if it's been cleared in the past. So there's a massive understanding from Brazil of environmental impacts globally. Um, as I said before, 44% of the EU's uh, soy goes into feeding livestock in the EU. So they are a big player. And I think personally, like it was amazing driving around Mato Grosso do Sol and seeing like soy and cornfields with rainforest belts right through the middle of them. It's really, really extraordinary. It was quite, um, quite inspiring to see. Moving on to America, America is quite a wealthy nation, but they have a large poor population. So they are focused on the E, but they are also really focused on the S, particularly around ensuring people have got enough to eat, as well as the undocumented residents. Now, the dairy industry, there's a big push saying that Trump's going to get rid of the undocumented residents if he gets in. That's going to put the dairy industry in a real pickle because 60% of dairy workers are undocumented, but it's also going to have a rather large impact on his hotels and golf courses. Um, so they have heavy farming subsidies. One thing I learned in the States, which was fascinating, is that they have got this system. So they've got different federal and state um, politics, which is not in itself electrifying. But they have a system which actually terrifies me in that for state elections, they can have mini referendums. So they're called ballots. And recently there's a ballot that's passed in California called Proposition 12. And Proposition 12 speaks to, from memory, um, the size of um, cages that eggs, veal, and pigs can farm in. And so on, when you go to vote for your president, your premier or whatever it's called in the state, um, governor, they, there's also a question that says, do you think we should be treating animals with respect? Yes. Now, that has fundamentally changed because it passed and it's fundamentally changed the way Californians can farm. 
Interestingly, it doesn't actually impact California because there are no pigs, veal or um, pork or, or chooks in that state. It does impact trade into that state. And the same thing has happened in Massachusetts. So this is how we start to get a slight little leak through with um, externals having impact on, um, on the way that we farm. Japan was fascinating. I really went to Japan thinking that, as a large trading partner, they're going to lead us um, down a clean, green image piece. I couldn't have been more wrong. It was really interesting. The government has a strategy called the Midori strategy, which is largely focused on the EU. Um, you know, reduction of chemicals, reduction of fertilisers, 25% organic, but their timeline is out to 2050, so they've got an extra 20 years. When I said... To, I also learnt that Japan supplies 70% of their calories through food um, imports, so they're really food insecure. So I was thinking, oh, gosh, you know, Japan are going to be leading. They will take anything. When I spoke to the government, they were like, oh, yes, clean green. Then I spoke to the commercial sector and they were like... I spoke to wine, wool, beef, dairy, horticulture retail supply chains and all of them said to be and I'm being I'm paraphrasing here because Japanese people are really polite but basically we don't give a toss about your environment or your animals we just want food and so I think for a little while we're going to still be able to compete um, to invest in Japan. South Korea again is this is very very similar to Japan they're interested in food safety and food costs the interesting thing with Korea is they're also interested in image so Starbucks is a really big thing there because they care about being seen walking around with a Starbucks cup moving on to the commercial sector I think this is largely where... So the, the governments are going to be doing government stuff the commercial sector is what we really rely on and they are the ones that are driving the change um, I, the Commercial sector still faces a few headwinds. And so I think the main reason for this is that food and fibre companies need to keep manufacturing to fulfil demand. So they've got their goals, but they need product to actually keep their supply chains going. So whether the true believers like it or not, there aren't enough people in the world that can afford to be fussy about where their food comes from. There also aren't enough farmers globally to supply the accurate data that the commercial sector needs yet. I want to be clear, I'm talking about listed companies because that's where most of our product, our, our broad commodities, will end up. What's driving all of this in the commercial sector? Well, fundamentally, it's investors. So investors want to be investing in companies that aren't doing any damage to the environment or people, etc. The challenge with that is investors typically don't have an understanding of how food is produced. Now, we're not Robinson Crusoe there. Investors invest in banks without any understanding of how banks work. They invest in electricity companies without any understanding of electricity. But we've got a challenge because they're putting pressure on us to farm in a certain way while they're also putting pressure on the company to remain profitable. Now, Woodside have recently seen this. Last week, for the first time, shareholders rejected the sustainability report of Woodside. So the CEO and the board of directors now have a serious challenge because they've got to answer the shareholders' profitability drivers as well as the shareholders' environmental drivers. <coughs> I might just move through um, to uh, one of the companies that I met, which was really interesting. It was a large um, agri-food business, so a large they make chips and all that sort of stuff. And they are they've got uh, a challenge to reduce their scope one and two emissions by 75% by 2030, and their scope three emissions by 40%. And so they're investing with farmers in practice change on farm. They're also really interested in regenerative ag. Um, and they're doing that because that's what their consumers want. So I then said to this guy, so obviously you're going to be preferentially buying from farmers that, uh, you know, have reduced carbon numbers because then you can, you know, report your scope three emissions. And he said, look, Catherine, the complexity lies in the fact that we would really love to do that and we will end up doing that over time. So it's important for you guys to keep measuring your data, but that we can't afford to at the moment because we don't have enough tucker to actually fulfil our supplier chains. So the, the reality of it is the ESG thing is happening and it's happening more slowly than I had thought. But let's be honest, I was like panicked, going, holy moly, the farmers need to know what's going on here. So it is happening. It is important that we start to implement data capture mechanisms on farm. 
If we don't get proactive and start leading this conversation, our government will do it for us, and we know that that never ends well. The speed of change is impacted by the complexity of food security, international trade, war, and growing divergence between the haves and the have-nots in the world. The ESG space is complex, it's interconnected and it's real. The commercial companies are the ones that are pushing mandates, so make sure you engage with your customers, you engage with your supply chain, you find out what it is that they are wanting. And it will be around natural capital, greenhouse gas emissions, your carbon budgets and your biodiversity. So those are the things that you need to start thinking about. How am I going to capture this? It's really important that you start somewhere. So find an LLS staff member and speak to them and say, you know, how do I just get started? Because if you don't start benchmarking now, you're going to find yourself left flat-footed. And the beautiful thing about finding out what's going on in the world is that we've got a lead time. So we can't keep running today's businesses using yesterday's tools. Change is lumpy and it's uncomfortable, but it's inevitable. And if we don't start changing now and capturing appropriate data on farm now to meet market demands, we're going to find that we're in a pickle because we're going to be dictated to by government. I think that we have the smarts to leave this, lead this agenda globally, and I know that within the people here in the room with the local land services, with the consultants and those sorts of things, really good hands to lead the change. Thank you. We're so lucky to have Catherine take us around the world in 20 minutes. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just ask, how can people catch up with you, follow you? How can they engage more with, with hearing your insights, your global insights? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm on... <laughs> I hate social media so much. Um, but I've just started doing this little, like, video series on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram. Instagram, I've got a stealth mode name, though. It's Missy Mazzy. Um, because I didn't want people to know who I was. And then I got an upfield scholarship and I was like, oh, now I need to yeah. tell people stuff. So, anyway, but Catherine Marriott is my Twitter name and my LinkedIn name. Um, also, I'll be here during Smoko and lunch, so come and have a yarn. I'm really happy to talk with any of you. I'm not an expert. I don't understand about the reporting stuff. That's not my strength, but I can point you in the right direction and I can answer any sort of global contextual questions that you have. It's really hard compacting that into... And, I mean, your narrative was wonderfully told. I'm sure there's people sitting in the audience here today who are like, God, I'd love to send that to my son, my auntie, my such and such. Would you be open to LLS maybe publishing part of that in their newsletter? Sure. <laughs> You'll also realise that I got a bit excited. Storyteller left half of it out. So, really happy to share. Well, the, <laughs> the storytelling was the piece that I think a lot of people will remember from here and what's happening in Brazil and what's happening in Asia. These are big big movements and if we have our if someone has their eyes around the world thanks to the Nuffield scholarship and yeah. thanks to you yeah. um, and relay that information back which I think is the purpose of the Nuffield scholarship mm. yeah. yeah no really happy to share and help in any way that I can great fantastic well there you go um, I'm sure Kate will be on to you after this for your speech no notes and what's allowed to be shared at the midpoint of your Nuffield scholarship and good luck with the rest of it thank, thank, you. thank you so much thank you. Thank you very much As Catherine said, it is smoko time. We have until um, 10.45. We'll give you a round up at 10.40 to come back into the room. At 10.45, we're back here. Morning tea, straight out the door, turn right and head down and enjoy yourself. Make sure you meet a few new people and make connections. Thank you. <laughs>